From Christianity Today, you're listening to The Bulletin, a podcast about the events, issues, and people that are shaping our world. I'm Mike Cosper, the director of CT Media, and with me today is Russell Moore, CT's editor-in-chief. We're going to talk about bowling alone and what that tells us about American politics and culture, Metzger Bar and Butcher, 303 Creative, and some of the challenges we see right now for pluralism. And finally, we're going to be joined by Krista Bowen, and we're going to talk about what to begin thinking about if you're getting your kid a smartphone for Christmas, which frankly is relevant if any of you have kids with phones. So stay with us. Okay, Russell, about 20 years ago, a book was published by Robert Putnam. It's called Bowling Alone. And I think it's safe to say it had a pretty tremendous influence on the way many people thought about American life and culture and the direction that it was headed in. Maybe if you could, why don't you give us a little bit of the sort of big picture? What what did Putnam uncover? What did he argue for? And tell us about the state of the world we were living in at the time. Well, Putnam's point with the bowling alone analogy is the loss of bowling leagues. You have uh, just as many people maybe bowling, but they're not part of a Monday night uh, group that bowls together. They're bowling by themselves. And he used that to show what's really happening with this kind of fragmentation and loss of voluntary association. So not the kind of big community that the state is and not your life by yourself or, or with your family, but those ties that are in the middle, that is what is uh, going away. And the thing that was striking to me uh, when I was thinking about this this morning is the fact that at the time that Bowling Alone came out, there were many Christians who were saying, look at what's happening to the world, and it's a good thing that we have the church to counteract that, the ultimate mediating institution. But in the years since, what we've seen is that it's not just bowling alone, it's praying alone, singing alone, in which we have church communities that are increasingly showing the exact same thing. People, even if they go to church every week, they don't really see themselves as being part of an ongoing community. I mean, there's so much that Putnam couldn't have foreseen that made all of those problems that he articulates in the book worse. I mean, he he identifies several things that are sort of root causes, urban sprawl, suburban sprawl, television, you know, and the generation gaps in technology. You know, those are three of the more significant ones that he mentions. And of course, all of that has gotten far worse. People are even sorted more dramatically in more polarized ways in terms of where they live. One of the things in his book that I found interesting, and as I was looking at it, I wanted to specifically ask you about this. He goes out of his way at one point in the book to separate this sort of loss of social capital, loss of social cohesion, to say that this is an independent phenomenon from the destruction of the nuclear family post-sexual revolution. And I was just curious your reaction to that thought, because that it's one of those things where I read it and I thought, I understand what you're saying, but I don't know that I believe you. <laughs> and yeah. I'm curious how you think about that. Well, I know what he means, but what I would say, it's not so much about the destruction of the nuclear family, the way that we think of it, and more in terms of the destruction of the extended family. So even when we have cohesive family structures right now, mom, dad, kids, very few people are living in the kind of community where they're actually... Uh, I mean, I was with my cousins all the time, and so I have this sense of knowing my cousins, my aunts, my uncles, my grandmother who lived next door, and the other grandparents who lived down the road. Very few people, because of mobility in American life, have that experience right now. I mean, there are all kinds of things that are the result of divorce culture and, and sexual revolution and other things. But in terms of this, I think that actually, that loss of extended family is even more significant. To me, this was the, the element of Putnam's book that was the most interesting and remains the most salient is just the reality that you can live your, your whole life, your whole day, your whole work life or whatever, and really never have to encounter somebody who looks or thinks differently from you, except in a very, very sort of shallow, transactional way. Whereas what Putnam was looking at was generations before him, where 
there was a bit more of a sort of a uh, unstructured melting pot to American society, and you had to find ways to figure out how do we make peace with these neighbors who believe something differently than us, or or whose lifestyle looks very different, or who's racially and ethnically different. P- probably more profoundly delineated around socioeconomic lines, I would guess, than before. But it it seems to just make so much sense to me why we're in a place where people politically just don't even know how to begin to talk to one another and comprehend each other. There's no context for empathy or compassion relationship. Yeah. And, you know, I think where that comes from largely is that we don't have a sense of need for one another. I I referenced maybe here on the bulletin uh, not long ago, Wendell Berry's new book of essays, where he's talking about the need for prepaid forgiveness he talks about being in a small community in Henry County, and you can't afford in that kind of a community to divide yourself up into Obama people and Trump people or, or all of these other uh, divisions that we have because you need each other. And so that brings with it a certain amount of, of bearing with one another. And, of course, that, that's completely resonant with what we see in the way that God has even designed the church. You have a multitude of different gifts. Nobody can carry out the mission of the church on his or her own. You need other people, that sense of belonging and membership. And the kind of power I think we have right now where we have the illusion, and it is an illusion, but I have the illusion that I can can live my life without you or with this very self-selected group of people who are just like me that I can connect with online. I think that is the kind of hubris that tends to lead to disconnection. We talk to a lot of people who don't like the loneliness and disconnection that they have, but they'll often say, well, what do I do about it? Because it just feels so weird to go up to somebody and and say, "Hey, hey, can you be my friend? Can you be my mentor? Or even let's start a bowling league. You know, it, it just becomes so so atrophied and so hard to do. When you think about the call of the Christian to love their neighbor, to be a faithful presence, is this, is this a, in a sense, sort of a, a, a call to action? Like that we, aside from the church itself as a worshiping body, should we be thinking about investing our time and energy as just good citizens, good neighbors, trying to rebuild some of those institutions? Of, of cohesion, bowling leagues, t-ball leagues, you know, the rest. Absolutely. And I think the way that we have to do that is to press through that initial resistance, that everybody is busy. Uh, you're, you could easily just load your life up with the activities. Uh, and they're going to be different for different people. I mean, a, a lot of people shouldn't be in a bowling league. Uh, <laughs> I would not be good in a bowling league. So <laughs> I've got to find other sorts of places that are more natural to connect. But I think the intentionality is the key. I think that sometimes the people who do feel the disconnection think everybody else is doing just fine and I'm not, I'm the one with the problem. When in reality, if you just take a little bit of initiative, what you usually will find out is that people around you are longing for the same thing. I wanna ask you to zoom out a little bit from this then. We've had a busy week since the last time you and I sat down and talked. Mm -hmm. The Georgia runoffs have happened. There were convictions against members of the Oath Keepers, a sort of quasi-militia group that was part of storming the Capitol on January 6th. There was a criminal conviction against the Trump Organization in the state of New York. And then you have other stuff that popped up sort of globally that felt of the same spirit. There were arrests in Germany related to some guy who wanted to overthrow the government and be reinstalled as as king, start the Fourth Reich. What's the old saying? Like, it's a curse to live in interesting times. Mm -hmm. When I revisited Putnam this week, all this stuff is happening in the background. There's this shared thread of disconnected, lonely people looking for meaning. It just feels like what you're seeing at the moment are these real-world consequences to it magnified in ways we haven't seen in previous decades. Yeah, we have this metaphor of war that we're living through right now. There was a study several years ago that was talking about trauma for soldiers who have been in war zones who are coming home. And one of the findings was it's not so much what that 
fact a person experienced as the fact that that person was experiencing that with a cohesive band of people around him or her, and then those people are suddenly gone hmm. when the person is out of the military. That's what leads to a great deal of the, uh, of the problems that come along with trauma after the fact. And I think we're living in that right now where there is an imaginary sense of fighting a war that's giving to people this sense of meaning and community that ultimately, of course, leads to real violence. Because what you start to assume is that everything that I believe in, everything that I want, it's a threat to me if there are people who don't want those things and who don't believe those things. Then it easily bleeds over into how do I use coercion whether cultural coercion or political authoritarianism, in order to achieve those ends. A friend of mine and I, who he works on a lot of uh, religious liberty cases, we were talking about religious freedom in this country. And I said, one of the really alarming warning signs that I saw several years ago is when there were people who would say on some issue or the other, well, yeah, religious liberty, but that's just playing defense. We need to play offense. And you realize what they mean by that, where the real action is, is the state. The real action is what the law is. And they don't see the life of the church, the life of the community, those things as being real. And so there's this sense of war play acting that I'm afraid is leading us to actual authoritarianism in many cases and actual bloodshed in other mm -hmm. cases. And I'm frankly surprised we don't see more of it than we do. One of the things we've seen in these weeks as, as some of the stuff has become more sort of the criminal side of it's been exposed. Certain circles, the Trump thing is sort of worn, lost its sheen, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think we asked this last week. I feel like it's worth asking again. Is the shine wearing off? Is the Republican Party moving away from Trump? Are we going to see new things? Or are you still looking at it? saying, yeah, it feels a lot like 2016 when people said never, and then a few months later they said maybe. You know? <laughs> yeah. The issue is for there are a lot of people for whom this is decided not on questions of moral principle, but on questions of what wins and, and what loses. And that changes really quickly. The day or two after Access Hollywood, it was really hard to find very many people who would not say, we're tired of this, let's move on from this. A day or two after January 6th, it was really hard not to find that. But what happens once they start to think, oh, well, this person is winning, therefore I need to be on the train, that happens. So I just am very reluctant to say at any point, okay, well, that era is over. We're moving to something else because things just move so quickly now. And there's also this sense, I mean, so much of, you know, you talked about earlier how Putnam was talking about television. It's easy for us to, to look back and say, well, television really isn't as important now. It's social media, it's streaming services, it's all of this. But that basic sort of reality TV narrative still sticks with the country. And that means that you have to have this arc of the hero who's doing well and then falls and then returns. And so I'm really skeptical about saying mm -hmm. this is over. Related to it, you've seen various writers, pundits, Christian leaders have sort of come out in the last couple of weeks and saying it's time to move on for one reason or another. I had this conversation with a friend this morning. We were talking about the tone of some of these responses, the tone of some of these shifts, and how there's always this sort of half-hearted element to it, and there's a voice that sort of seems as consistent and, and certain all the way through. And this is every editorial page where there are conservative pro-Trump people saying it's time to move on. So I'm not trying to target anybody specifically. But what was interesting, this friend of mine says, it's the liver king. Now, I'm guessing... Russell, you don't know who the Liver King is. I do not know who the Liver <laughs> King is, yeah. So, so the Liver King is a social media influencer who is pro-ancestral lifestyle. Basically, what this means is that this guy kind of looks like a caveman, dresses like a caveman, lives like a caveman. And he's known as the Liver King because he got famous for eating raw liver raw organ meat, pretty much the worst possible raw organ meat you can imagine. There are dozens of videos of him doing this on Instagram and talking about how 
you can have a happy, healthy life and look like a Hasbro superhero figurine if you just eat raw liver and ride horseback and hunt with a falcon. Not worth it. Right, exactly. I became familiar with him because people in the like combat sports world are always interested in nutrition and fitness and stuff. And so they're always blogging about different things. They always make fun of the liver king because he just, you see him and you obviously realize this guy's on performance enhancing drugs. Mm. Nothing about him is natural. So for years and years, denial, denial, denial. And then of course, this week comes out, the liver king is on pretty much every performance enhancing drug <laughs> you can imagine. So, you know, raw liver and anabolic steroids. <laughs> That's all what, you need. That's all you need. Well, what was fascinating was this. This is what my friend was pointing out. He says, yeah, so he he admits to all of it. And then he kind of contextualizes it in, yeah, but the reason I needed to do this was because I had these other medical problems. So he creates this very carefully hedged, I'm not quite as terrible as you think I am. My friend's point, I think he's just totally right, is what we see right now is this, it's time to move on, it's time to do this, it's time to do that. But there's still this hedge of, refusing to actually look at what's taken place and have any sense of ownership and responsibility for how we've gotten here. It's alarming when you see situations in which there's not anything really shocking, where the only difference is whether or not this is working in a really uh, crass, sort of uh, obvious kind of way. I mean, I have mixed feelings about it because on the one hand, I really want people to move in healthier directions, and I don't really care what kind of story they have Mm -hmm. to tell themselves uh, in order to do that in some ways. On the other hand, you look back and you say, some of this we're just going to repeat if all that matters is that, well, these unhealthy things that we supported before, now if people have gotten tired of them, well, then Mm -hmm. you're going to find something else. And that's what's alarming to me. Mm Mm-hmm. Not to bring it back to the liver king, but to go back to the liver king one more time here. <laughs> Part of what was fascinating, I went and went down the rabbit hole and watched all this stuff, and he's got his apology video. And in the apology video, he's still the liver king. He doesn't have a shirt on. He's got his crazy beard. He's got his crazy Mongolian headgear thing that he <laughs> wears. And I think that's the piece of it that's so resonant to me, the sense of sort of certainty about the future and doing what we have to do and all of that. The mask never slips in a way that I think opens up a possibility of the kind of restoration, reconciliation, real movement towards health that we need. Yeah, and it might be even more the case with the viewers of The Liver King Mm -hmm. rather than The Liver King himself. Mike Murphy was a longtime Republican political consultant, talks about these studies into con men. And he said the most difficult thing in the world is to convince people who have been conned by a con man that they have. Because Mm -hmm. in order to do that, they have to tell themselves a story about themselves that they don't want to tell. So they'll find a way to say, you know, well, I mean, the liver king, he maybe he <laughs> did just need some steroids to help with a sinus right. infection. That's fallen human nature. That's what we all do. Yeah. He posts his apology video, and then the next video, he's back to eating raw yak. So <laughs> yeah. onward yeah. and upward. Onward so and goes upward. our world. A couple of things happened this week. A lot of our listeners are probably going to either have heard about or be familiar with and certainly be curious about. Two quick instances. One was a funny thing that happened. It showed up in the Washington Post. It it went around social media a bit. There's a restaurant outside of D.C. called Metzger Bar and Butcher. And there was an organization called the Family Foundation that had reserved a table for a very large group. They were in town because of a Supreme Court case that I'll mention here in a moment. Members at the restaurant, owners of the restaurant, employees of the restaurant, who I'm not exactly sure who it was, identified the group and associated them with the fact that this was a conservative, pro-life, anti-gay marriage, pro-religious liberty kind of organization and said, well, you're not really welcome here. And they canceled the reservation and it became a little bit of a hubbub. They were in town because of a legal case that's before the Supreme Court right now involving a company called 303 Creative, which is a graphic design company that's suing the state of Colorado over religious liberty questions because this designer does not want to have to build websites, have to do graphic design for gay marriage. 
in the background of this is the should you bake the cake, should you build the website, should you do the flowers question, which which has been discussed a whole, whole lot. And I think probably most people have drawn their lines in the sand on the question. I think the bigger question and the one that's relevant to a lot of what we've been talking about, you know, there are a lot of Christians who probably like you and I are saying, man, what I see happening from the tribe I grew up with is really, really disturbing. Then something like this sort of this Metzger bar and butcher thing happens, and you end up feeling this sense of like, well, they don't really want me over there anymore. And then these people over here are broadcasting pretty loud and clear that they don't want me either. How do you live in this tension of a little bit of a sense of homelessness, but then more broadly, this idea of like, I want to live faithfully. I don't want to live my life for the culture war. But these people over here also think there's a culture war going on, and some of them want to sue me. <laughs> so you've thought a lot about this. I, I would love to hear how you've processed this in the last couple of years. You can only deal with the stuff that's happening in your immediate vicinity. And so I get really tired of evangelicals who adopt the look what you've made me do sort of uh, justification <laughs> and mentality to say, well, the left is using coercion and the left is doing it, so therefore we should do that too. Mm. No, that's not a Christian ethic at all. The second part of it, though, is that there's a distinction between what one should do and what the government should be empowered to force someone to do. And that's really, I mean, the 303 creative case, that's what it is about. It's not about, oh, can you, if you have a hotel, decide that you don't want to serve certain groups of people, or you have a restaurant, you don't want to serve certain groups of people. We have a consensus in this country that that should not be the case with those kinds of public accommodations. It's when specifically you come down to this question of, is the person using his or her creative expression in these very specific sorts of ways actually endorsing something that violates their consciences? Now, again, you can have people who can have very different ways of coming down on this. I mean, for instance, with same-sex weddings, I knew two wedding photographers both of whom held to historic Christian orthodoxy when it comes to sexual ethics. One of them said, look, when I'm photographing a wedding, it's kind of photojournalism. I'm documenting what happened here. I'm not a participant. The other photographer is saying, when I'm part of a wedding, what I'm doing is I'm coming in and finding ways to celebrate the unique love of this particular couple and their family, and I'm, I'm putting a lot of creative energy in making that work. I am a participant, and that violates my conscience. Okay, we have a category for that, biblically, in terms of Paul with the Corinthians with the meat offered to idols question, which is don't violate one another's consciences. Some people can recognize this meat doesn't have anything to do with, there are no idols in the world, I can eat it. Other people are going to be made to stumble by that. We've got a category for that. The question is, what should the government be able to, at the point of a gun, force someone to do? When it comes to those questions, we have a little more consensus or quite a bit more consensus than the culture warriors on either side would want us to. Because most people do have a category to say, okay, forcing uh, Billie Eilish to sing at a Trump inauguration when she doesn't support him would be the wrong thing to do. Okay, we, we've got that. Most people agree with that. And we also agree that we ought to be trying to find ways to accommodate and to live with one another. So I, I actually think that this Supreme Court case is going to be clarifying when it comes to creative expression, but we're still going to have that larger question of where's the line between this is rude behavior or this is convictional behavior or this is potentially illegal behavior? That's the question mm -hmm. we have to wrestle with. This is where I think it, it connects to the Robert Putnam thing, which is we don't have categories for sharing air with people who don't think exactly the way that we do. And a culture just can't survive that way. I mean, it will perpetually escalate in many of the ways we've already seen if we don't come up to a place where there's an element of forgiveness and there's an element of hospitality for, I mean, I think even in Christian categories, theological categories, 
part of the nature of strangers and pilgrims who were passing through the land of Israel, the land of that kingdom, part of what made them strangers and foreigners was that they did not worship the same gods. They did not have the shared beliefs. And there's just so much clear instruction to the Hebrews to to be hospitable, to, to care for them, to care for their needs, to essentially love those neighbors. And the degree to which those categories just seem to have been drained out of the world we live in. I don't know how a culture perpetuates when somebody walks in the room and says, you can't eat here, you know? And again, like on the right, you've got people saying, well, let's disenfranchise the people who are voting against us. Yeah. Well, I mean, in this case, take the restaurant, for instance. What you have happening is this entire incident is really beneficial for the hardcore culture warriors on both the right and the left. Because inevitably, when this happens, the restaurant's able to raise money. I can put up a GoFundMe page. Maybe we're being persecuted because we're standing up for equality and so forth. Or even just a lot of people are going to say, I'm going to go eat at that restaurant because they share my values. While the people who are kicked out are able to raise money, look at how we're being persecuted. And so that often happens, not just in this situation, but in a lot of them to the point that it's in the interest of the conflict entrepreneurs, to keep that going, including in ways that that are just really destructive to all of us. Yeah, that, that got me to my last question, which is how much of this is f- not fabricated in the sense that it's a lie, but fabricated in the sense that it's being amplified and exaggerated in ways that don't actually reflect the lived experience of ordinary people. Is this unique to... DC area <laughs> kind of restaurants where there's going to be this kind of attentiveness? Or do you think the alarm is warranted? Well, I think it's not happening a lot. But anytime that you have these really high profile incidents where it does happen, then you end up with the kind of thing that we're seeing right now where everything is politicized to the point that the restaurant at which I'm eating is signifying something about who I am in terms of political tribe, which is not a healthy way to live. I mean, we ought to have places where we can eat because we want the food, not because we want to signal I am of whoever. And so that can actually accelerate it and increase it. We ought to be able to have empathy for both the restaurant. They have employees who said, we don't want to serve this group. You don't have to agree with the way that they see the issue to say to them, this would be the equivalent of serving a segregationist group, something like that. And I don't agree with that analogy, but that's the way they're thinking. And so you have employees who say, I don't want to do that. They don't show up. The restaurant says, what can we do? You ought to have empathy uh, there. And people on the left ought to have empathy uh, with Family Foundation or other groups who are saying, look, we're advocating trying to call people to see what we believe to be true, good, and beautiful. We want to convince you of that. And you don't have to agree with us in order to allow us to exist. We have to have that sense of understanding that in order to move on from this situation where increasingly the products you buy, the music you listen to, the places you eat are all about tribal signaling. That's exhausting. What you just said, I think is fantastically true, that if an organization is actively doing a certain kind of lobbying work or they're speaking publicly about abortion and gender and sexuality in such a way that they're saying, we advocate for what we believe because we believe, we do this because we love our neighbors, right? That's fantastic. And I think part of the reason why we are where we are, however, is that the dominant voices are not articulating these culture war questions in any way that's shaped by love of neighbor. It is the fear mongering, they're groomers, they're coming for your kids. And so I think in some ways, there's a culpability on the part of believers. If everything's a five alarm fire, we shouldn't be surprised that our interlocutors are reacting in the exact same way. Yeah, often in these situations, whether you're talking about the right or the left, a lot of times the people who are, I I don't like the military metaphors, but in the trenches locally, working on whatever the cause is, often are healthier than their Mm -hmm. loudest spokespeople are, and they're the ones who usually have to bear the brunt of it. 
And I think the reason for that is that they can't get away with caricaturing the people Correct. who are on the ground locally. Yeah. That's so. exactly right. That's exactly right. If you because it, at at the national level, uh, usually what people are trying to do is to activate the passion of their base. But if you're running an environmentalist organization in eastern Kentucky, you can't afford the luxury of just raging against the machine. <laughs> you have to find a way to deal right. with mountaintop removal. And mm -hmm. if you're locally at a crisis pregnancy center doing pro-life work, you can't demonize the people who disagree with you if you're trying to persuade people that there's a nonviolent solution to a pregnancy that is in crisis. I think the actual work often tends to humanize people in ways that advocacy just can't. All right. Well, it is Christmas time. We've got lots of parents buying presents, getting ready to give their kids new phones, new technology of all sorts. And I know for me, the first time we bought our kids a phone, you felt like you were handing them a weapon <laughs> for the first time. It's kind of terrifying. So, Russell, I've asked a friend to join us for a conversation about things to be thinking about when introducing new technology to families, to kids. Her name's Krista Bowen. Um, Krista is the co-founder of Screen Sanity, an organization that helps families pursuing digital health. She recently published a book called Well Framed, which is about grounding social media in God's love. And she publishes a newsletter called The Social Compass, which is for Christian parents looking to integrate faith in the digital world. So, Krista, welcome. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us today. Hey, Krista. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, why don't we start at the beginning when parents are thinking about getting their kid that first phone, that first smartphone or device. You know, probably most teens are are getting a device that has a lot of access. How should you think about stepping into that world with them for the first time? Getting your first phone is just such an exciting milestone. And oftentimes that happens right here at Christmas time, right? And at the same time, today's parents are really having to reckon with the growing amount of research that is correlating increased unhealthy screen use with the growing mental health crisis in, in the United States and across the world. So just earlier this year, you know, a survey came out that showed that 44% of American teenagers report being persistently sad or hopeless. You know, at the same time, only 14% of those kids share that they've ever had a helpful or productive conversation with an adult about the digital world. It can be awkward to have those first conversations on Christmas morning about setting expectations and boundaries. It's probably the greatest gift that you could give your kid to really pause and think through what is the opportunity here I have to really coach them and help cast a vision for the role I want this phone to play in their lives. And it's so much easier to start slowly and start in a limited way. So maybe you're starting with texting one-to-one -one with other people before adding on more complicated conversations like group text texting or photo texting, maybe before you're adding, you know, a full-blown social media account, you're starting with an account that your family has about your family pet. So you're looking for ways to gradually increase freedom as your child demonstrates responsibility and trust. Yeah, I think one of the things you've talked about, and I've heard you speak about a number of different times, is part of our default is often, how can I put up the right fences? How can I manage this so that they're, they don't have access to anything that's troublesome? How would you think about that aspect of, you know, building a relationship around these things, starting the conversation around the difficulties and the challenges that come with the phone or the temptations that come with the phone. This is a scary topic. You know, parents are bombarded left and right by the dark realities that our children are finding themselves in. You know, we've got cyberbullying, you know, comparative pressures of social media, and then, you know, modern pornography, which is violent. And so our, our natural gut reaction is to just try to seize control. There isn't a magical number of screen time minutes that you can hit or a list of apps that you can download or apps that you can avoid that will guarantee that your child's going to stay safe. We are going to make mistakes. And rather than focusing on trying to have all the answers and to be the experts and to stay in control and to draw strict boundaries, it's really important for us to show up not as knowers, but as learners. I think if we can step into a posture of curiosity with with our kids, that's going to really play to our advantage as we're trying to mentor and guide them in the digital world. I have two sets of parents in mind. One would say, 
okay, this phone, you're going to use it, but it's my phone. And that means I'm going to look at your texts and your group texts and, and all of your activity to help guide you through this. Another set of parents say, you know, we want to trust our child and we don't want to violate privacy in that way. So we're not going to, that would be like reading her diary or something right. like that. So we're not right. going to do that. Which of those two approaches is closer to what you would recommend? As you think about those two things, the device introduction process is kind of like driver's ed, right? You don't start when they turn 16, you just hand them the keys and they're magically ready to drive. You know, you start in a limited space where it's really safe. So you take them to the Walmart parking lot and you test out really simple skills. I mean, you're coaching them, right? When they get to a, to the point where they're ready to sit behind the wheel, you are sitting in the passenger seat, logging lots of hours, watching them as they are hitting potholes, coaching them, talking them through what's happening. And eventually you're releasing control a little bit more and a little bit more. Accidents do happen in the digital world. And so staying in the game with them is just like asking them to wear a seatbelt. You know, you wouldn't put them out on the highway without somebody there to teach them how to stay safe. We really encourage parents to just step into the messy middle of navigating those tough challenges along alongside them. Yeah, I like the the sort of the imagery of the driver's license and the sort of slow transitions towards freedom because there does come a day when we're not looking over their shoulders. Right. And so I think that sense of progression is important. I read a story yesterday about a young girl, a minor, who was essentially groomed by a predator and led to sort of follow him and, and sort of disappear with him. The parents were stunned because they were like, she doesn't have social media. She doesn't have access to any of this stuff. How on earth did this guy find her? And what they eventually found out was they connected in Yelp reviews. Mm. This guy was looking for her via Yelp reviews and found a way to connect and go from there. And it's kind of related to that. As much as you might trust your kid not to go looking for porn, porn is looking for them. That's right. It's mm -hmm. coming their way. And so that's where I think the attitude of like, oh, I just really trust my kid Great, you trust your kid. Do you trust the other 6 billion people on the other side of those those phones? And how are you preparing for that? And we hear stories all the time of like good Christian kids who are, you know, just their parents have no idea and they end up in these awful situations and and one of the best pieces of just thoughtfulness I I heard around this was a a friend who, you know, she did everything right. She had filters on all of their devices, coached her kids intentionally, and her child still ended up in, an, in a situation where sex torsion happened. So if you aren't familiar with sex torsion, it's, you know, somebody grooms you by asking you to send a picture of your toes, and then they ask you to send more and more, you know, pictures until eventually they've got these nudes, and then they they threaten you, they blackmail you to share um, the image with your whole school if you don't pay them a certain amount of money. A lot of times these people are on, you know, the other side of the, of the globe, and there's no real accountability for the situation that they've put you in. When this kid came to mom and dad, the best thing she said that she had ever done was just to let him know that when you make a mistake in the digital world, it is going to come back at you tenfold. You are going to make mistakes. I expect that you're going to make mistakes. And when it does come back at you tenfold, I am the safe place that you can come to. I won't I won't be judgmental of you. I won't be shocked. One of the things we like to share with parents is just practice your poker face. You know, even like mm -hmm. have your <laughs> spouse say the most shocking things imaginable to you possible mm -hmm. because we want you to be receptive and open. We want those kids to keep coming back and asking you when they run into those hazards so that you can have the conversations you need to have with them. Well, and that's key. The parents that I've seen that have done this the best are the parents who have kind of intentionally trained themselves not to, when their child comes to them and says, here's what I've done, the response is not, how could you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, when we, we, we've raised you better than that, instead, they kind of set a pattern where there's manageable crises that the yeah. parents, you know, it's good that the, the child is coming to the parent and you can work through it. That's, I just think that's critical. We kind of want to release our kids from shame, right? Because shame would like, have us hide those things, but really they we don't want them alone in the digital world. We want to be right there with them. One of the things that I found when my kids got their first smartphones was I just realized how, you know, it, it's the cliche that, you know, parents don't know what the kids are doing. Parents are behind in all the trends and all the rest of it. You know, you hear all of that and then the kids get their phones or whatever and, you know, it's been a while. So, so even back then it was like, oh, wait, 
they don't use Facebook. They don't use Twitter. Every they don't even really use Instagram at, at the you know the, it's all on Snapchat. And now you know I know enough to know that it's really not even that much on Snapchat. Now it's all TikTok. Do you think as parents, you know, we should be thinking about trying to stay ahead on those kinds of trends, or is there another way of approaching it and thinking about how you engage with the kid around the way the landscape changes so constantly? It's changing constantly, and um, we have to just recognize that we aren't going to be the knowers. We have to be the learners. We have to stay curious. And that means staying curious about the things that our kids are interested in in the digital world. And um, maybe we aren't the expert. Maybe we don't have all the answers about every app and what's hot and what's not. It also means staying curious about our own role that we are playing in modeling healthy habits for our kids. So one of the great pleasures we've had is to be involved in a community-wide campaign to prevent teenage suicide. And mm. at one of the teen council meetings, we asked kids, what is the number one thing parents can do to support your mental health? And their answer was, put down your phones and talk mm. to us. And so, you know, I think of the wisdom of Kurt Thompson, who says, you know, we all come into the world looking for someone who's looking for us. And so we have to get serious as parents about what countermeasures are we putting in place so that we are attentive and we are present when those things do pop up. We do have wisdom that they need. They crave conversations with us. The truth is oftentimes we're too distracted by our own digital lives that we aren't even <laughs> available to help them in theirs. And, you know, that that makes sense. We're expected to be so much of our lives today are online, there are different types of friction we can put in place to just kind of keep technology in its proper place and and be available for those conversations. Yeah, it's kind of that, that old cliche, like you can't take your kid someplace that you haven't gone yourself. The other thing is like, if you give your kid, you know, an iPad and they get Minecraft for Christmas, it's just taking five minutes and sitting down next to them on the couch and saying, hey, take me on a tour of your Minecraft world. Or, you know, if your kid's in the realm of TikTok, you know, stepping into the ring and saying, I'm going to learn a dance with you. Or just trying to get curious about seeing the digital world through their eyes and pursuing their hearts there because it's a very real part of their reality and it's not going away. It's not changing. That's an important point because I think there are a lot of parents who think, I have to be educated ahead of time so that I can guide my children through it. When in reality, most kids actually do want to talk to their parents about the things they're interested in, including uh, online uh, trends and, and digital trends. And so just, just asking the question is enough. You really don't have to be uh, a, a Sherpa guiding them through it, knowing the, the way ahead of time. Let me, let me pose this to both of y'all as we wrap this up. What would you see... You know, what are you seeing emerge in, in maybe the last few months or the last year or two? Obviously, COVID has changed this landscape pretty significantly. Are you seeing hopeful signs? Are there things that are making you optimistic about the way families and, and kids and even tech companies are, are setting things up so that it's it's getting healthier? Are there signs of hope in life? Let me start with you, Krista. Yeah, absolutely. I think we started our work about five years ago. And at that time, the only options for parents were either like full-blown access to the digital world or like you're going back to like giving them a flip phone. But the great news is that the market is really starting to pick up and offer things for families that allow you to introduce devices in a gradual way. So we've got these amazing new products coming out like smartwatches that, you know, only allow you to call or text, you know, five people that your, your parents can watch. There are these first phones that are coming out um, that allow the parent really to get granular and to have a little bit more control about who the kids are interacting with and what they're allowed to receive. And so, you know, we can kind of start to see hope in the way that parents have more options to make better, healthier choices. A story that popped up recently was I was talking to a middle school teacher who shared with me that she always kicks off her year by having kids with the same writing project, she has them pull out their devices and show a picture from their summer to the class and then write an essay about it. And it's sixth grade. They always love this assignment. It's their favorite assignment. This year, she asked the sixth graders to pull out their phones and share a picture. And she said 80% of them didn't have a phone or they didn't wow. have access to a picture. So I think today's parents, we tend to think we're the only one who is concerned about this, but really the trends are showing that parents are stepping 
thinking more intentionally into this. So if your kid does come home and share with you that they're the only one without a smartphone, that they're the only one without Snapchat, it's really important for you to check in with other parents and not just, you know, receive that information from your kids. Because oftentimes we get ourselves into these situations where we are just caving into the FOMO or, you know, wanting to make sure that our kid doesn't get left out. And so we, we hand them these things, hoping that they'll be more connected, but they end up in these places that accidentally are harmful to them. When the reality is, if we would have had those conversations directly with other people in our community, we might have felt more confidence to make better choices that we weren't the only ones who are doing that. And that can apply, you know, even within families. Um, I know sometimes there are tensions even between like when I send my kid to grandparents' houses or when I send my kid over to a sleepover, you know, how do I start these conversations? And I just want to encourage you at Screen Sanity, we have a lot of resources that are designed to help you start those conversations. We love to be an outside voice that um, kind of say the hard things or be the bad guy so that you don't have to. Because the more that we can get on the same page as communities, the easier this challenge will be to tackle. Yeah, I agree with that. But another hopeful sign I see is just the fact that uh, several years ago, uh, most parents, porn was the only thing that they were really talking about. And so trying to keep their kid uh, away from porn, which is critically important. But sometimes that led to a sense of not worrying about everything else. And now I'm seeing parents who realize uh, they can have uh, severe mental health issues coming from group texts, not because people are necessarily even being cyber bullied, but because you're looking around and you're seeing the things that you're not invited to. Uh, or judging yourself up up uh, over against somebody else's life. And so I see parents who are really paying attention to the full spectrum right now in ways that I think are going to be beneficial for kids. Okay, well, we're going to wrap with actually turning the tables on you, Krista. Your podcast, every episode ends with you throwing out these rapid-fire questions. Okay. So I'm going to throw them out to you. Okay. And, and Russell, I want you to tag in as well. One to two sentence answers or one to two. I don't remember what your rules are, Krista, but I'm just throwing it at you. So there's four of them. First one, what is your favorite piece of old school technology? My favorite piece of old school technology is snail mail. Mm. I just think about the days of the Pony Express and how to, in order to communicate, in order to send a message, we had to wait. We had to think, we had to dream, we had to hope. And the joy on the other side of actually making that connection and receiving that connection, that's something that um, we've lost in these instant gratification of these quick communications that we have today. And so every time somebody takes the minute to write me a handwritten note, I really, I really still spark joy. And mine would be old-fashioned uh, clocks. <laughs> I mm. love the sound of clocks ticking, the kind that you have to wind up and let go. I would amen the, the the handwritten note. That was actually what I had noted to myself. So, all right, fill in the blank. Being a teenager in 2022 is? Pressure is the word that comes to mm. my mind. Just so much pressure. Yeah. Russell? I would say uh, being a teenager in 2022 is much uh, more similar to being a teenager in other eras than we think. Mm. Uh, so much of the pressure of what do people think about me? Who am I? All of those things are really timeless. They're just in a in a much more pressured and immediate sort of environment. Yeah, that's great. All right, third question. Your favorite app, the one you can't live without. Krista. Spotify. All right. Spotify, Russell? It would be a tie probably between Spotify and I, the podcast app that I use, Pocket Cast. Uh, it would be a tie between the two of them. I think my ties would be obviously my podcast app. I use Overcast and Evernote. Like my whole, if I if Evernote ever goes down, I lose ninety oh. percent of the things that I know. Well, you know, Mike. So. As you say that, I'm gonna change mine because Google <laughs> Keep is what uh, is ah. what does that for me. And when I was right. locked out of Google Keep, I felt like I had no access to my brain for a couple <laughs> weeks. <laughs> totally. Yep. All right, last one. Favorite trick to keep your tech in check, Krista? Yeah, my favorite trick is to wear a smartwatch. I love being able to, mm. um, you know, I find that one of the things that keeps me most addicted to my tech is wanting to be available for the most important people in my life, my husband, my kids, the school nurse. <laughs> and 
when I'm able to kind of filter, use my smartwatch as a filter, it allows me to set my phone down and just really know that the people who really do need access to me will access to me. And I'm not going to accidentally, you know, be tempted to go down a rabbit hole of peeking at all the other things that are available there. Russell? Mine is having rooms in my house where I don't bring my phone. Uh, or any other device. And so if I know that, you can get yourself into a habit where there are, there are rooms you're just not accustomed to being connected. And I think that's helpful. Krista, thank you so much for being with us. We are grateful for that. We are going to link to a number of these resources in our show notes, including an extended episode that you've done on this topic. And that is it for us this week. Thank you once again for tuning in to The Bulletin. Bulletin is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producer, Eric Petrick. Host and producer, Mike Cosper. Producer, Azure Phelps. Graphic design, Brian Todd. Social media, Kate Lucky. Director of operations, Matt Stevens. Music, Dan Phelps. Production assistance from Core Media. Coordinator, Beth Gravencourt. Audio engineer, Kevin Duthu. Video producer, John Rowland.